Welcome to Spry Online for July 3rd. My name is Ken Lawyer, one of the pastors, and we're so glad you're joining us as we pursue Jesus together. Today we come together to encounter God and celebrate His great love for us. It's our hope that the Lord will speak to you through the music, readings, prayers, and message. We hope this time of worship leaves you renewed, refreshed, and ready to serve God in the world. Let's worship. Yeah. 
Hi everyone, we want to thank you again so much for worshiping with us today. A reminder that if you're new to Spry, please fill out a connection card, which you'll find at sprychurch.com connection. If you leave your contact information on that page of our website, we'll be glad to send you church updates, answer any questions that you might have, and of course, connect with you. And here's a few ways of how you can be part of what God is doing in our church and in our community. We are so excited about this summer's Vacation Bible School. We're going to have a lot of fun with kids from our church and our community and tell them about Jesus. The dates are Sunday, July 10th to Thursday, July 14th from 6.15 to 8.15 p.m. in the evenings. Please help us spread the word and invite your family, friends, and neighbors. All kids aged 4 to 12 are welcome. You can register at sprychurch.com VBS. We'll also need a lot of help transforming areas in the church here at School Street into water and beach themes. You're invited to VBS Decorating at the School Street Campus on Saturday, July 9th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. or until we're finished. Anyone's welcome to come and help. All church and VBS families are also invited to join us for our VBS Celebration Sunday. That's July 17th at the Pine Grove Campus at 10.30 a.m. or the School Street Campus at 11 a.m. where our surfers will sing and give a recap of the fun we had at Make Waves. Following worship, both campuses will come together at noon for a potluck church picnic at our School Street campus in the community building field. Please bring a dish to share as well as a lawn chair. Drinks and paper products will be provided. All are welcome and we hope you join us. The Finance Committee is extremely grateful for the thoughtfulness and numerous people over the years who included our church in their estate and will planning. Through their generosity, they continue to make an impact far beyond their time here on earth. Legacy giving contributes in vital ways to our ministry, helping us see lives touched and changed by the power and love of God. We invite you to consider the opportunity you might have to make an ongoing difference in this way. If you'd like the information about legacy giving to God's work through Spry, please contact the church office. Do you want to learn more about Spry Church and how you can find your place in our community of faith? If so, join us for Next Steps on Sunday, July 31st from 12.15 to 2 p.m. at the School Street Campus. This is a casual gathering where you'll get to know others and learn more about how you can pursue Jesus with us. The session will end with an optional brief discussion for those who are interested in joining our church family. Lunch will be provided and child care is also available. Please register at sprychurch.com slash next steps or by contacting the church office. And now Pastor Ken will lead us in our prayer. Let's pray. Holy God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of coming into your presence to worship you today. Speak to us, we pray, and receive our prayers and our praises. May this time be a time in which we encounter you and grow in faith and trust in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading today is Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. 
Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, Fourteen more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They, They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. God loves your enemies and does something about it. You might think, I don't have any enemies. But consider the people you don't like. They may or may not rise to official enemy status, but you know you have a hard time liking them. Maybe it's an irritating coworker or competitor, neighbor, or even family member. Some of these people you might not know personally, but you've seen enough. That crazy driver who nearly cut you off in traffic the other day. The voices in the media or social media expressing views that you find completely misguided. There they go again, whoever they is for you. It's easy to slip into the mentality of us versus them. If you've ever struggled, as I have, with any of these impulses, the book of Jonah is for you. God loves your enemies and does something about it. That's one of the lessons of Jonah's story. In recent weeks, we've looked at the first two chapters of Jonah, and today we continue with chapter three. Jonah is a familiar story for many people, at least parts of it. But don't let the familiarity prevent you from seeing what God has to teach us in this book of the Bible. Here's what leads us to this point. The word of the Lord came to Jonah and told him to go to the city of Nineveh and preach against it because of its wickedness. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, the enemies of God's people, Israel. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Instead, he fled in the opposite direction, got on a boat, and headed for a place called Tarshish. Jonah ran away from God. But God continued to reach out to Jonah. Last week, we heard about a song Jonah wrote that ends with the words, Salvation belongs to the Lord. He resisted God's call at first, but Jonah learns that the one who can deliver us from these downward, destructive spirals in our lives is God. That brings us to our reading for today. The Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim the message I give you. This time, Jonah obeyed God and went to Nineveh. Nineveh was a big city, very big. It took three days to walk across it. Jonah entered the city, went one day's walk, and preached, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. In Hebrew, his message is just five words. It's a short, odd sermon. No mention of Nineveh's sin, no mention of how to respond, and no mention of God. 
Just 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Jonah can be pretty stubborn. I get the idea that his mindset here is a bit like when siblings are fighting and then mom or dad says, you need to apologize to one another. So maybe while looking the other way, they mumble, sorry. Typically not the most heartfelt communication. Jonah just said, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. He didn't want to carry that message. We'll learn why next week. But Jonah did the bare minimum. Here's the brilliant part of the story. The last word of Jonah's short sermon can be translated overthrown or overturned. It means just that, turned over. It can refer to a city being overthrown or destroyed, like Sodom and Gomorrah. But it can also be used of something being transformed, like turned over and changed into its opposite. Comically, Jonah's words actually came true, but not in the way he intended. Nineveh does get turned over as Jonah's enemies repent and find God's mercy. The Ninevites listened to Jonah's sermon and they trusted God. They proclaimed a city-wide fast and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. They dressed in burlap to show their repentance. Even the king of Nineveh put on sackcloth, repented, and trusted God. He issued a proclamation in Nineveh that said, By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. The king ordered everyone to fast and wear sackcloth, even the animals. (laughs) Imagine livestock dressed up in burlap as a sign of repentance. The king called for the entire city to repent, to turn from their evil ways in hopes that God will turn from anger and relent from punishing. God saw what they had done, that they had turned away from their evil lives. He did change his mind about them. What he said he would do to them, he didn't do. Nineveh repents, God relents. Again, this is Nineveh, the capital of mighty Assyria, Israel's long-standing, bitter adversary. Assyria had threatened Israel for many decades and finally destroyed the northern kingdom and scattered its citizens in the 8th century BC. Just hearing the name of Nineveh would have sent chills down the spine of any ancient Israelite. Assyria was a country of violence and bloodshed, and Nineveh was its capital. These were the enemies of God's people. We think of enemies and might feel threatened, but look at what God can do. God loves people you don't like. You know who I mean. The ones who really get under your skin. The people who seem to have it all wrong and badly need a course correction. And when you think about them, you can feel it in your self-righteousness, your anger, your anxiety, your cynicism, and maybe your fear. But have you ever considered how God views those people? Our great God can redeem even the worst of situations, even a whole city living in wickedness turned to worship the Lord. His love is redemptive and far-reaching. Steve Saint was born and raised in Ecuador, where his parents were missionaries. His father, Nate Saint, was one of five young men killed in 1956 by the Wodani tribe, whom they were trying to reach with the gospel. After his father's death, Steve attended school in Quito, Ecuador. From the age of 10 years old, he would spend summers living with the Wodani tribe in the jungles, the very people who had killed his father and four other missionaries. By this time, they had become Christians. The lives and eternal destinies of many people in that region have been transformed turned over, changed into something else by the good news of God's salvation in Jesus Christ. Steve was baptized in the same river where his father's body was found. And he was baptized by the same man who had killed his father. But it's ultimately a story of redemption. He writes about it in his book called The End of the Spear. And the story was told in a movie released in 2005. God is at work in all kinds of ways, helping people turn to him, even our enemies. 
We see that most clearly in Jesus. Jesus, who died to bring us back to God and to break down the barrier of hatred dividing us from other people. Jesus, who prayed on the cross for those who crucified him, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus, who commands us, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. God reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are Christ's ambassadors. You are called to represent Jesus in the world, in your place of work, your family, the community, wherever you go. Carry and live out this message of forgiveness and reconciliation, which we so desperately need today. Jonah is a good example that you don't have to do everything right for God to use you. God can use anyone to bring about his restoration and redemption, even someone as stubborn as Jonah. God uses imperfect people like Jonah and people like you and me to share his message of salvation. God loves your enemies and does something about it. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you for your faithfulness and goodness, that you are continually reaching out to us, and not just to us, but to others in this world, even to the people we have a hard time thinking about in positive terms, the people that we struggle with, whether we know them personally or not, how easily, Lord, we can put up these walls that divide us from other people, that lead us to act in certain ways or think in certain ways toward others. And God, there's a certain pride in all of that that we need to name and repent of because we don't know the hearts of other people, but you do. And what we see here in Jonah's story, and what we see most clearly in Jesus, is your amazing desire to share a message of good news, of forgiveness, of hope, of reconciliation, of transformation with the whole world. That your desire is for everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And so, Lord, we lift before you the people in our lives whether we know them or not, we have a hard time loving the people we struggle with. And God, maybe the differences are so great that we can never truly be good friends with all of these people. But would you speak to us in such ways and help us to shift our perspective and know that you see these people in love through your eyes of compassion and grace. We hear your word, God, and sometimes, like Jonah, we struggle to obey. Sometimes we can be selfish, but you are constantly at work in this world and in our lives, and we thank you for that. And we give ourselves to you. We pray, Lord, that your work will continue within us, that we will be transformed in all the ways that you call us to be, so that more and more we can be part of your work in the world today. Hear these prayers, God, for the people we lift before you now in these silent moments. Whatever the concerns may be, health concerns, relationship struggles, financial pressures, hopelessness, whatever people may be facing who are on our hearts right now, we lift these people to you. We lift our lives to you in these quiet moments. Lord, hear our prayers. Thank you, God, for your love and goodness. Thank you that you are always ready to hear when we pray, that you invite us to pray and to communicate with you. So, Lord, receive these prayers, receive our lives, which we offer to you in the name of Jesus, as now we pray together the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And friends, as we continue in this time of worship, we come to an element of worship that we use every week in our worship of God. And why do we use these words? Why do we say this? It's not simply because it's one more thing to do, but it's a way in which we respond. We hear God's word to us, and in response, we affirm our faith. And there are many ways to do that, but one way that we do that regularly here at Spry is by using these ancient words that speak so powerfully of what it means to believe in God, to belong to God, and that we say these words not alone, independently, on our own, but together as part of the community, part of God's people, the church around the world. And so, church, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, on the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today we want to take a moment to celebrate how God is working through our church and how we're pursuing Jesus together. Scripture says that we were ambassadors for Christ, that we represent Him wherever we go. Recently, Spry Church helped to support Eric and Heather Barr as they followed God's call to serve on a mission trip in northern Iraq. They were part of a team that provided medical help to a Kurdish refugee camp. Here's a clip of an interview of their testimony. So what did you do when you were, while you were there? Well, this was a medical mission. And by background, I'm a speech therapist, and certainly I wasn't doing that there. <laughs> but um, I served as a pharmacy tech. So I was in the pharmacy counting and dispensing medications and with the help of our translators, explaining to the refugees how to administer and how to take the medications um, that we were leaving them with. Right, so I'm a family doctor. So I did what I do in my real job. <laughs> right. which is solve patients um, using translators because we were useless without them um, and we just tried to help we um, the trip took our own pharmacy of medications um, probably 30 or 40 different drugs we had right. um, and we had you know nursing staff we had a surgeon and then we had a bunch of uh, family docs and we saw in the week between 900 and a thousand people Wow in, uh, in five days of work in a clinic and um, so we were there just to try to help is what we were there to do. That's great. Yeah. I think what was interesting when he mentions how many people we helped, it, it progressively got more and more mm -hmm. because the first day the people of the village were very reluctant. Mm -hmm. They've been so devalued and, and poorly cared for that they weren't certain that it was safe to come and get care from us. Sure. So the first day we maybe saw 75 people and partway through that day, the woman who oversees the camp came in and she said, the word is sp spreading quickly through the camp, the, how welcoming and how loving the people here are, and just get ready. Mm -hmm. And she was right, because the next yeah. day we had like 130 people, and each day progressively yeah. it snowballed. more and more. Yeah. It was amazing. Well, I um, want you to think, and each, uh, each of you get an opportunity here to tell um, I guess one favorite thing or one, one moment or something that sticks out to you from the trip um, that spoke to you? I think probably the most profound moment to me was we had meetings with our translators after the first day. Um, our translators were college educated folks, young folks, mid 20s, upper 20s, who do not deal in medicine. And so they were hearing these stories and translating from Arabic to English, and they speak Kurdish. So they're fluent in three languages. And as Heather spoke about the, the natives, the locals we were working with, were impressed by our 
our, our caring, our love, our generosity, and, and they were shocked that we would take care of our enemies. Right. And it struck me right. because you think Iraq, mm -hmm. and I think the general idea as an American that Iraq, oh, they're bad. But they're not. They're great people. They're loving people. They're caring people. And their government maybe has a little different spin versus we are their enemies. And so to hear, number one, that we were their enemies, but yet we were there sharing our love and time and generosity, it, that, was, that was impressive to me. And, and I did, never thought of them necessarily that way, still don't, but that was a pretty profound statement that that was a, a, a felt vibe from the trip, which is, which is great, yeah. And they said that. Yeah. They said that we are truly seeing what love thy enemy means. Oh, great. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Was there anything that stands out for you? I mean, that moment the same as well, but for me, oh, I'm gonna start to cry. Nor? Mm -hmm. The children, oh my gosh. <laughs> the kids. Yes. There's so many, so many kids. There are 3,000 families in this refugee camp and many have lived there for eight years. So having two very healthy boys and, and living a good life and having the things we need and going there and seeing how little they have, but yet how they appreciate the smallest of things. And every day we would come to the refugee camp and the bus would bring us in and all of these children are just standing outside of the gate waiting just to touch or shake our hand or give us a hug. So we would go in and we'd do our work and at lunch break or when our work day was over, I would immediately run outside because my next best thing other than serving in that pharmacy was the fellowship with the children. And I just, I fell in love with so many children. I seriously sat and thought about, is it reasonable for me to adopt some children? Sure. Um, so it was just so moving. All of the children, there was one girl in particular that stole my heart. And um, we've decided that we're going to sponsor her okay. because there's a way that you can yeah. sponsor children there um, through monthly funds that help them get school supplies and clothing. Mm -hmm for the small school they have on the refugee camp. So that'll be my way to stay connected. The full interview, which is 11 minutes long, can be found on the Spry Church Community Facebook page. We praise God and thank Eric and Heather for listening to God's call in their lives to go on this mission trip to Iraq. That's an example of the kind of work God calls His people to do, restoring lives and restoring goodness in our world for the sake of the kingdom Jesus came to build. And it's an example of what your giving helps support. We want to thank you for your generosity, and we want to continue to follow God's call individually and collectively as a church, pursuing Jesus together.
Now the blessing. Live in the confidence of God's goodness for you and know that you are not alone. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.